योग कर्मसु कौशल गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन आई एम निकिता मिश्रा फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ केमिस्ट्री गुजरात यूनिवर्सिटी वेलकम यू ऑल इन द ऑनलाइन रिफ्रेशर कोर्स इन केमिस्ट्री होस्टेड बाई डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ केमिस्ट्री गुजरात यूनिवर्सिटी अहमदाबाद ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ डॉक्टर जगदीश जोशी प्रोफेसर डिरेक्टर यू जी सी एच आर डी सी गुजरात यूनिवर्सिटी एंड डॉक्टर दिलीप वसावा असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर रिफ्रेशर कोर्स कोऑर्डिनेटर एच आर डी सी डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ केमिस्ट्री गुजरात यूनिवर्सिटी वेलकम यू ऑल इन द सेशन ऑफ डॉक्टर चारूलता दुबे असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर स्कूल ऑफ नैनो साइंसेज सेंट्रल यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ गुजरात गांधीनगर इंडिया इन हेज एकेडमी इन हर एकेडमिक्स she has completed graduation from ajamgarh and post graduation from gorakhpur she has completed her mtech and post doc and doctorate degree from indian institute of technology new delhi in her research work the thrust area includes development of advanced material for water purification stimulation of radiation damage in nuclear fission and fusion materials by employing surrogate method of ion radiation characterization of ion beam induced radiation damage nanotechnology microprocessing of materials she is also an independent international collaborator with radiation damage study in iron phosphate glasses and zirconolite glass ceramics germany stimulation of alpha damage of iron phosphate glasses cea france stimulation of damage caused by decay of nuclear waste glasses iuac delhi in her research contribution she has 21 research publications and seven conference proceedings in various national and international conferences additionally she has six technical reports three book chapters and two ongoing projects she is also a part of invited talks she has given more than 20 invited talks in various workshops webinars seminars and conferences she has presented and attended a conferences and workshops more than 30 she was involved in teaching of masters and phd students she also took a several lectures of material selection and properties for different applications visiting faculty of nanotechnology education and research center nrc india guest lecture of guest lecture in delhi university guest lecture at central university gandhinagar provided teaching assistant for btech physics laboratory classes in her achievements she was awarded 100 percent financial international travel support from dst india to attend conference at usa represented iit delhi in japan as a part of jen es 2008 best poster award in open house competition iit delhi highest cgpa award for 2005 pg batch in iit delhi first runner up in mtech at department of physics iit delhi national eligibility test conducted by csir government of india in 2004 cleared joint entrance screening test by dae government of india in 2003 graduate aptitude test in engineering gate conducted by mhrd government of india in 2003 apart from this she has computer skills and programming languages experience cobel pascal c c++ and various softwares she has editorial experience editorial experience as a reviewer for ceramic international journal of alloys and compounds journal of fusion science and technology journal of radio analytical and nuclear chemistry she has professional membership as a lifetime member of society for material chemistry lifetime member of powder metallurgy association of india lifetime member of iron beam society of india lifetime member of plasma science society of india she is also expertise in various instrument instrument handling like scanning tunneling electron microscope sam tem 
वाइब्रेटिंग सैंपल मैग्नेटोमीटर एट लो एंड हाई टेम्परेचर एफ टी आई आर यू वी विजिबल एंड रेम स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी एक्स आर डी मशीन एंड एल सी आर मीटर शी हैज कम्प्लीटेड टू प्रोजेक्ट शी हैज कंट्रीब्यूटेड एज अ रिसोर्स पर्सन इन मोर देन टेन कोर्सेस इन हर रिसर्च सुपरविजन टू एम फिल एंड टू पी एच डी हैज कम्प्लीटेड एंड थ्री पी एच डी आर ऑन गोइंग थैंक यू Hello everyone. Myself, Dr. Chawla Sarkar. I am employed as as an assistant professor in School of Central uh, School of Medical Sciences at Central University of Bihar. Today, I will be talking about the electron microscopic techniques for the characterization of materials. Materials can be at different scale, like microscope, nanoscale, and sometimes it is not possible for for us to see with bare eyes. So we need some instrument which can be magnify the object so that we can see. the utility of the magnifier uh, kind of microscope is for the microstructure and surface surface morphological study as well as for 3d investigation sometimes this electron microscopy technique can be used for the composition analysis as well so let's start so what was the need to invent this microscope so just now i mentioned that small object cannot be seen with rare uh, rare eyes so we need some help of instrument so some example of magnifying instrument like magnifying glass so magnifying glass is a convex lens it is generally uh, kind of framed in a handle you can see over here so in our childhood we used this kind of magnifying glass to concentrate sun radiation and as a result a kind of hot spot got generated and eventually there was kind of fire it was fun activity at the childhood on the right hand side you can see optical microscope this is the image of typical microscope we have seen in our 10th or 12th class uh, uh, physics or chemistry lab maybe 12th class physics and chemistry lab for investigation of different kind of investigation next so optical microscope in optical microscopy the probe is light so this is uh, earlier uh, nearly 4 this is 400 year old technique so generally scientists and engineer used to Uh, see the microstructure of material. So very old technique in that sense. Now this is very important. How to select any microscopic technique? So the very first thing we should have, we have to be very familiar with the dimension of our object. So depending upon the dimension of our object, we have to select our technique. suppose this is some dimension in kind of micrometer so even our optical microscope is well enough but uh, suppose your material is in some nanometer scale then we have to go for the electron microscope so uh, in general even in optical microscope or electron microscope resolution is function of wavelength so this is a, a typical electromagnetic spectrum here you can see the ranges of different objects as you can see over here that this is the size this is uh, for the reference so human eye can see up to this point this is uh, around 150 micron this is a dia of human hair so we can see up to here without aid of any instrument but beyond that we need light microscope which can go up to 400 500 nanometer but beyond that this light microscope can't assist us so we have to go for the micro electron microscope Why electron microscope? The probe is the probe which electron microscope use. That is the electron. It electron is having shorter wavelength. Means shorter than the light. Generally, visible light is having uh, kind of uh, wavelength that is from 400 to 700 nanometer. However, electron is electron microscope is having wavelength shorter than even 400 nanometer. So this is very important to select our instrument very carefully. So what should one it should be very much. clear about what we want to see in our object and what is the range can it be seen with the light microscope then well enough if it can't be seen with the light microscope then we can go for electron microscope if it is possible with the scanning electron in sample preparation for the electron, scanning electron microscope is very easy if it is not possible with this scm machine then we can go for the transmission electron microscope Trans sample preparation for the transmission electron microscope is big tough 
So here is comparison between optical and electron microscope. You can see that optical microscope and electron microscope, that means transmission electron microscope, is very much similar. Optical of system is very much similar. So as in the optical microscope, even transmission electron microscope is having a condenser lens, then objective lens followed by projection lens. However, for the STM machine, optical system is different. Uh, we will discuss it later. So, in this sense, optical and electron microscope are very much similar, especially optical microscope and transmission electron microscope. So, let's have a look, uh, look at the optical and electron microscope. What is the uh, difference between the magnification and resolution? What is the magnification? Mag magnification is uh, uh, defined as the ratio between the image size to the object size. And it can be changed by the distance between object and the fine lens. We will see how what does it mean. So magnification with the uh, electron microscope is usually thousand times better than the optical microscope. Resolution, how about the resolution? Resolution is defined uh, the point at which two or more objects can be distinguished, uh, distinguished as a separate object. Suppose these are two objects. So how well these two object, objects are separated together? That will be decided by the resolution limit of the instrument. So, for electron microscope like transmission electron microscope, resolution limit is 0.5 nanometer, which is 1000 times better than optical. So, here again, the definition of magnification, this is the ratio between the image size and the object size. As you can see, if we suppose some, we insert some instrument here, let's say magnifying glass. So, just by changing the distance between the object and the final lens, we can change the magnification of the image. Now resolution, as just now I mentioned, this is a defined at the two, uh, at the distance which at which two images can be well resolved. So what is the main difference between the optical microscope and electron microscope? So in optical microscope, we use light as a probe and it is having a kind of a wavelength. We use, it uses visible light of wavelength 300 to 700 nanometers of view. But in op electron microscope, as we all know, the electron is having dual nature. That uh, every particle is having wave nature as well as uh, uh, wave is having particle nature. Here we are assuming that electron is a particle. So it is having wave, uh, wave nature as well. So wave nature of electron is represented by this was first given by the de Broglie. So with every particle, there is a wave associated with the particle. It is known as a de Broglie wave. So, wavelength of de Broglie wave is given by lambda is equal to h by mv. We can see here, if we increase the velocity of the electron, the wavelength associated with the electron will go down and down. With the optical microscope, we can't go beyond 380 nanometer. But with electron, we can go even beyond uh, less than 300 nanometer. Just by increasing the velocity of the light. That's why we are switching from the light to wave to the particle. Particle we can control by changing the acceleration voltage we increase, with increasing the velocity of the particle. This is the main advantage. This is the kind of motivation uh, for, for changing from the light to electron. Now image resolution in optical microscope. This is very familiar formula we have done in our 10th or 12th class physics for chemistry. Resolution again, this refers to minimum distance between two points at which they can be distinguished. The typical formula is R is equal to 0.61 lambda divided by mu sin alpha. So for air, mu is equal to 1. And if we take visible light, typical visible light, 400 nanometer. So best resolution with optical microscope is 0.42 micron. However, Suppose we have some of some features in our sample which is less than 0.2 micron, it won't be well resolved in optical microscope. Then what is the need? We have to bring down this lambda value. How we can bring it down? So simply just now we have I mentioned we can in, uh, bring down the lambda value. We can shift from the wave nature to light nature, from light to electron. So this is the this is the motivation for shifting from the light to electron. So this is the uh, this is again de Broglie wavelength associated with the particle like electron or any particle any moving particle with like electron. So if we increase acceleration voltage, this is the 
kind of excitation voltage in the electron column we will see just now what does mean by electron column so if we increase voltage as you can see if we are increasing voltage so accordingly wavelength associated with the uh, electron is decreasing here it is 0 0.004 nanometer again at 200 you can see this is just half 0 0.002 nanometer so if we keep on increasing the excitation voltage the wavelength associated with the electron will go down if the wavelength will go down so what will happen so resolution of the instrument will go down just now we have seen that resolution is directly proportional to wavelength of the probe so let's say uh, let's again come to the electron microscope this is again a de broglie wavelength associated with the electron this is your uh, typical of the electron gun this is source of the electron they are being accelerated to acceleration column so suppose if you are applying 80 kV, so wavelength corresponding to 80 kV for the electron that is lambda, that is the de Broglie wavelength will be 0 0.004 nanometer. If we increase voltage from 80 to 100 nanometer, it will go down to 0 0.003 nanometer. So as a result, resolution of the instrument is improving. If we keep on increasing the voltage, resolution of the instrument is improving. So typical acceleration voltage is generally 60 to 100 kV in XDM machine. So wavelength is uh, just by controlling the wavelength or acceleration voltage we can improve upon the resolution of the system. So now here is some milestone in the history of electron microscope. We all know that electron was discovered by J.J. Thompson in 1897. Again I mentioned the de Broglie concept was given by de Broglie in 1924. It was concept that every particle is having wave nature as well as wave is having particle nature that is known as a particle wave duality so again there is a different kind of uh, kind of progress in the electron microscope finally hrtm came into picture in 1986 1970 and 1986 ruska got the nobel prize for the same Let's come to the scanning electron microscope. Basically, XCM is formed by focus electron beam that scans over the surface area of the uh, specimen. So, XCM machine is having very good magnification starting from 20 times to 100,000 times magnification. The important thing is that it can give us the composition analysis as well as. XCM is having resolution around 1 to 20 nanometers. However, in the TM, it can go up to 0.5 nanometer as well. We will come to the TM later on. So let's start with the instrumentation. This is the electron source and then there is a set of optical path. Electronic beam is con uh, controlled to the electromagnetic lenses. Uh, so this is condenser lens that it can go uh, again after condenser lens it goes to the scanning coil. After scanning coil, scanning coil what does the scanning coil does? It deflects the electron beam. Then it goes to objective lens. Here it interacts with the sample. Then different kind of signals comes out of the sample. That is being analyzed in XCM machine. So we have mainly three systems. First one is electron optical system. Then sample stage over here. Then number of detectors over here. And then image display unit. This is the instrumentation part of the XCM machine. Let's come to the signal extension. What kind of signals come from here? So as just now mentioned, whenever incident electron will be here, so uh, there will be some uh, there will be different kind of interaction. So the most important is the second is uh, secondary electron. What does it mean by secondary electron? There are uh, electron may scatter elastically as well as inelastically. If it is scatter elastically, means without any loss of the energy, so it is known as a back scattered electron. If it is scattered inelastically, means there is loss of the energy of the electron, they are known as a secondary electron. So generally secondary electrons are used for the topographical contrast and back scattered electron for composition contrast. There are other signal also like X-ray, generally this is used for the compositional analysis of the sample. So this is, uh, we call it EDS or WDS analysis, energy or wavelength dispersal analysis of X-ray. So these X-rays are analyzed and these gives information about the composition of the sample. 
So basically, elastic scattering, this one, this is uh, whatever we get from the uh, elastic scattering, they are then known as the back scattered electron. They are the incident electron, the same as the incident electron, they are scattered by atom in the speculum. In elastic scattering, however, they are scattered, ejected from the atom. Suppose this is atom, electron is coming. If it is scattered from the atom itself, then it is back scattered electron. If some electron is ejected from the atom, then this is secondary electron. So this is a basic difference between secondary electron and back scattered electron. Back scattered electron are scattered by atoms in the specimen. But the secondary electrons are ejected from atom in the specimen. This is very important to note because these are two very important signals in STM machine. Secondary electrons, main role of the secondary electron is for the topographical analysis and back scattered electron for composition contrast. Next, go ahead. Now, let's come to the electron specimen interaction. Once electron is inside the uh, sample, so it may, uh, it, it is there to lose their energy. Okay. So, there can be different kind of interaction, elastic and inelastic. In elastic interaction, it may uh, scatter from the atom and it will produce back scattered electron. So, back, ele back scattered electron, you can see that top 300 nanometer here, they will give compositional contrast. And top, you can see top 50 nanometer, it is you. Uh, this is the volume from where the secondary electron comes because it is coming from the atom itself, not scattering from the atom. It is coming from inside the atom. So, that is why it is used for the topographical contrast. Or, and then there are other signals like X ray, just now I mentioned. So, there are different kind of interaction between a specimen and incident electron beam. One more thing that is the electron probe diameter. We will come across this. So, this is the trajectory of electron beam once it is inside the, this is simulated to Monte Carlo simulation. This is the uh, ET detector. So, this is the, if you see, there are different kind of electron beam. This is the secondary electron, B is for, for back scattered electron. So, this is very commonly used uh, detector. This is known as the ET detector. Here, the SC travel with large diffraction, you can see here. It is travel this large diffraction towards the detector. However, this back scattered, you can see this is directly traveling towards the detector. Again, there is a Faraday cage. If suppose, uh, if it is in front of the detector itself, here you can see. If it is negatively charged, so what will happen? Uh, suppose, so the secondary electron ejected, they have very less energy. Just few EV. So, they will be stopped. However, back scattered electron will leave the detection. So, in this way, just by changing the uh, potential uh, kind of uh, this value, charging, we can select the electron. Whether we are kind of, whether we can select secondary as well as back scattered electron just by changing the uh, kind of uh, potential applied to the Faraday cage. So, this is one way to select the secondary electron or now, let us come to the contrast formation. This is again very important to understand the STM. So, there are two kind of contrast, topographical and compositional contrast. Let us understand topographical contrast. What is the contrast? Basically, you can see this picture. Why? Because background is white and this font size is in black. Then why you can see? Suppose if I have it is in yellow color, very light yellow or light uh, sky blue so you won't be able to see or if you can see very with very hard it was very tough to see you the this light that's why um, generally it is suggested to go for black and white why contrast is good so similarly for the same also uh, what is going to create contrast that is number of electron from some area if number of electron is going to come in large number so that will be brighter from some area, if it is number of electron is coming in a less amount, that is going to be kind of dark. So, that is going to create in contrast in your STM image. So, basically, topographical image refers to variation in signal area. What is variation? What is signal here? That is number of electron, which is coming from the different area in your specimen. That will give about the parenthetical as well as compositional information about your sample. 
So for temperature effective uh, contrast, it is the primary source of contrast at CMA. How we can go for the topographical contrast? That is from the secondary electron. That is in the elastically scattered. Again, this kind of contrast is constructed from two effects. That is a trajectory effect, then electron number effect. Let's move to the trajectory effect. As the name suggests, suggests the trajectory effect means there is a this contrast is or due to the spark difference in the trajectory. So let's focus on the variation. Suppose if this is a sample. This is uh, this is some feature in your sample. Okay, it arises some variation in sample and it is your detector over. Okay, the suppose some electron is being ejected from this sample, this surface as well as this surface. Whatever electron is ejected from this surface, it is going in this direction. And if it is ejected from this surface, it is going in this direction. Similarly, this will go this direction. But suppose some uh, some surface from where this electron is going directly to straight to detector. So this surface will look brighter. So this area will be brighter. However, the area which is not facing towards the detector, they will look dull. So this due to the trajectory work, there will be topographical contrast. So the electron emitted drop from the surface, which is not facing the detector, will reach the detector with difficulty. And the area which is facing the detector will reach the detector very easily. And this trajectory will create a contrast in the number of electrons reaching the detector. That's why it is known as a trajectory effect, which is creating the contrast. So this is again, you can see the area which we are facing the detector, they are looking brighter. If it, this area is brighter, it means uh, your detector will be somewhere here. That's why your area is brighter. Okay. If detected here, that's why this face you can see it is dull. Similarly, your detector is somewhere here. That's why this area is brighter. Number of electrons reaching the detector is high in this area. Similarly, over here, over here. However, the opposite faces which you can see, number of electrons reaching the detector is not enough to create. So, the area from which, like this area, it is very hard for the secondary electron to reach the detector. That's why this area is looking dark in the image. How about the faces which is directly facing to the detector, they are looking brighter like this. So this contrast is to the trajectory effect. Second one is the electron number effect. Again, very interesting. Suppose you have some topography in your sample like this. This is a schematic of some topography. So, when the electron probe hits the sample at an angle, let's say assume this angle, let's assume you have some this, this kind of feature in the sample. So, what will happen? This is your some curvature in your sample. So, uh, and then your, your sample is having some flat area also, as well as some curvature. So, uh, what will happen? If you see from flat area, we are having less number of electrons coming out from the subject. But if you see the trajectory one, large number of electro secondary electrons are coming from the curved surface. So, if your sample is hitting a um, hit surface, suppose at an angle, more number of electrons will escape from the spe uh, specimen than flat sample. So, it will reflect in your topographical contrast. So, whenever there is a sample which is, uh, which is hitting electron at some angle, so large number of electron will escape from the curved surfaces than flat surfaces. This will create contrast in number of electrons reaching the detector. So, this will lead to that certain area in the specimen such as curvature, they will look brighter and however the flat samples will look darker in the image. Example. So, this is an example of electron number effect. So, this is your brain boundary. Can you see this bright line? So, here the electrons are seen are uh, kind of escaping from the this point. So, that's why they are brighter. However, this is flat surface. So, less number of electrons reaching to the detector. So, we can see brain boundary very nicely. This is flat surface. Less number of electrons reaching the detector. So, it is moderately moderate. However, brain boundaries are quite bright in the nature. Here we can see some inclusion. Again, some something. That's why it can be used for the 3D analysis also due to the electron number effect. Let's come to the compositional effect. Till now, the trajectory effect, electron number effect was it due to the 
secondary electron. Now we are coming to the back scattered electron. What was the secondary electron? Secondary electron was in an inelastically scattered electron which was coming out of the atom. Now it was not scattered from the atom. Now we are coming to the back scattered electron. Back scattered electrons are electrons which are scattered from the atom inside the sample. They are going to come create compositional contrast. So this is again related to the composition. As I mentioned in the very first, the back scattered electrons are electrons which are scattered from atom inside the sample. So if it is being scattered from the sample, suppose we have two sample, two uh, two things. One is having copper, second one is tungsten. Tungsten is having high number of electrons. So scattering of electron from the tungsten will be higher than copper. So the area where tungsten is there, so it will look brighter than copper one. So that uh, due to that uh, difference in the Z value, that is the atomic number value, it will be seen in the image also. So basically composition contrast is to attributed to, to the big back scattered electron. In whenever we will collect compositional contrast, how we can come collect back scattered electron? Just by changing the uh, uh, voltage to the faraday case to the AC detector. So difference in the number of back scattered electron collected by the uh, detector will appear in gray scale, either in black and white. Suppose you have just now mentioned copper and tungsten. Suppose if it is tungsten, it will look brighter. If it is copper, so it will look not that bright. So just by the brighter scale, we can compare that these are two atom pair. So higher atomic number will look appear bright. So this is how we can distinguish what kind of elements are there. Anyway, one more way we will come across that is the X-ray analysis. So this is a composition contrast. Same uh, same uh, image, this is uh, constituted from the secondary uh, secondary electron, this is a back scattered electron. Here you can see the bright element is let's say copper and uh, the less uh, bright that is a gray scale that is due to the copper. copper. So uh, immediately you can make it out. There is some uh, difference in the composition of the material. Let's move out. Resolution. Resolution is again very important parameter for the electron microscope. How we can control the resolution? Because because of re resolution only we have shifted from the optical to electron microscope. The uh, in optical microscope res re resolution was decided by the wavelength of uh, invisible laser the minimum ray wavelength possible is 400 nanometer we can't go beyond that however with electron just by uh, this dual nature we can uh, see broadly wavelength we can apply acceleration voltage we can accelerate electron so the wavelength associated with the electron can be shorter and shorter so it can see uh, shorter features and it can draw shorter features so here is expression for the probe diameter so this is a area at which the um, electron is hitting the sample so this is the expression for the probe di diameter this is the probe current which is flowing the amount of electron which is going inside the sample again beta is the beam brightness this is generally controlled by the acceleration voltage as well as the electron source so generally uh, there is different kind of gun like in typical older SA machine, there is tungsten thermionic gun. Nowadays, there is field emission gun. And this field emission gun, we call it FESM, field emission SPM. So generally, and there is in conventional SPM, there is a tungsten in older days. Nowadays, lab six, LAB6 is there. That filament, that electron gun is source is of two kinds, that is tungsten. That is again thermionic emission, LAB6 also thermionic emission. However, LAB6 is 100 times better than the thermionic, tungsten one. But field emission gun is 1000 times better than thermionic gun, that is tungsten. Nowadays, generally we go for <coughs> field emission only. Again, one more important parameter is alpha F, that is the convergence angle. What is the convergence, convergence angle? That is the kind of determined by the final aperture and the working distance. This is very important, working distance, the, um, uh, working distance and final aperture. So in order to improve, uh, go for the better resolution, we have to control our probe diameter. 
So to get high resolution, we have to minimize probe size. How we can minimize probe size? Just by increasing brightness and alpha f. That is the uh, we, how we can uh, kind of uh, maximize this uh, beta just by shifting from the thermionic gun uh, or LED stick to field emission. That's why in field emission we go we can get go for better resolution. Nowadays everyone goes for the field emission. This is the reason that's why we opt for the field emission because here the size of the probe is smaller. This size is smaller. That's why we get better resolution. This size is smaller, that's why we get better resolution. And what is the other way? The one is beta, that is uh, why we are going from the conventional SCM to SCM. Second one is alpha f, that is how we can uh, kind of increase this by increasing the working distance. We somehow we have to increase this, that then, then only it will go high and high. So these two parameters can be controlled by the adjustment of the this sample state or by adjustment of the electron source from going from the conventional SCM to FESC. Now specimen preparation, some precaution needs to be taken here for the SC preparation. Let's take for the, let's, uh, we are going for the topographical information. The moment I am saying topographical information, it means I am talking about the secondary electron, that is the elastical electron. So for this topographical, minimal sample preparation is required. First, you need to select your sample size so that it can be mounted on your sample state. In the machine, you have to check the what is the size of the sample state in your machine. Okay. Now you have to remove sample uh, contamination, number of high, uh, contamination. Even if you touch by hand, then also it will get contaminated. So you have to clean it very nicely uh, to remove all kind of contamination by some organic solvent, maybe isotone or might not put, dip your sample in some solvent, uh, organic solvent and then put it in ultrasonic cleaner, maybe 10 or 15 seconds. Then don't touch it onward, onward. Once it is clean, then handle it carefully. If it is not clean, it is sample which is not clean. So you can see here that there is some kind of uh, line effects are there. This is due to the dirtiness kind of some kind of hydrocarbon. When we are focusing, it is leaving its impression. So this is not desirable. So to avoid this kind of artifacts, we have to clean our sample very nicely. So to remove hydrocarbon, we have to, we are supposed to clean our sample with organic solvent, such as acetone or methanol. And we have to, after this cleaning, we are not supposed to charge our sample. So these are some precautions which needs uh, which needs to be taken here. One more uh, precaution for non-conductive specimen because we are talking about the secondary electron. Now what will happen? Suppose this is your sample surface. Electrons are coming. Suppose if the electron is in, uh, accumulated here, so what will happen? This will not allow the incident electron beam to reach the specimen. So it kind of uh, scattering will be there. So we will get wrong information. So what we have to do, whatever inform, uh, electron is accumulated is accumulated here. So we have to provide a path to go to the, we have to ground the sample. There are two ways. First, uh, your sample should be coated nicely with some conducting layer, kind of gold or anything which is conducting. Generally, carbon or gold is coated. So to avoid accumulation of charge over here, sometimes we need to provide path also. If it is very insulating, generally we provide path with silver Space. So, suppose there is some charging effect, so we will get this kind of artifact. Can you see? We, I, we can't see any kind of, we can't take any kind of information due to charging. So, just because, just now I mentioned, if suppose electrons are accumulated over here, electrons are coming, so it will just deflect it. We can't see any information, just bright spot. Whenever you have bright spot, it means your sample is very non-conductive and it is the charging effect. It is not feature of your sample. So you have to again prepare a sample. How we can prepare? You have to coat your sample with some conducting material and then you have to, you should provide a conducting path as well. So these are two few suggestions for the sample preparation in the machine. Now let's come to the transmission electron microscope. Transmission electron microscopy is very much similar to the optical microscopy. What was the need? 
in the earlier also i mentioned first depending upon the feature size you are supposed to select your instrument suppose if you can see some features through the optical microscope microscope then you should not go for a scanning electron microscope if your features are less than 150 micron um, 150 micron then only you should go for the scanning electron microscope suppose your features are less than 10 nanometer then only you should go for transmission electron microscope so what is in scm is very good minimal sample preparation and we can get 3d information as well as compositional information tm is a good technique but it requires lot of sample preparation it is again used for topographical study as well as for crystal structure study let's say so utility is uh, in the microstructural study as well as the crystal structure study. This is the first picture of the transmission electron microscope. This was demonstrated by Nall and Ruska in 1931. This is the first commercial TM 1939. Later on, Ruska got Nobel Prize in physics in 1986 for this construction of the machine. So these are the picture of some modern TM machines which is available nowadays in the market. So as I mentioned, there are different kind of interaction of electrons which matter, elastic scattering and elastic scattering. The important for the TM and analytic TM and TM is elastic scattering. So electron which is suffering from the change of velocity, that is energy, is used for the is used in analytic TM, means conventional TM. However, the, for HRTM, there are different kind of electrons are there in the TM machine, elastically and elastically. Elastically used for the conventional TM and elastically scattered for electron for the HRTM. It will come what is a HRTM? This is a bright field limit, dark field limit. So let's come to the instrumentation part. As in towards in the STM machine, there is an electron source and then there is an illumination part and then sample is phase imaging and then magnification then data recording part. So depending upon the excitation voltage, wavelength of electron wave can be controlled and hence resolution can be controlled. In a typical TM machine, generally up to 200 kV is applied. However, in higher end, it can vary from 40 to 500 kV. Uh, the best possible resolution with the TM machine is 0.2 nanometer and resolution up to 10 to the power 6 can be achieved. So this is this is again summary of the signals from the for the STM and TM machine. So in the conventional TM machine, there are different kind of signals like elastic uh, scatter, elastic scatter, and different kind of undivided beam. And this all we have seen in the STM. That is a elastically scattered electron. That is elastically scattered electron. Then X rays for compositional elastic. Different kind of signals are used for different purposes. Similarly, for the TM also, different kind of signals are used for different purposes, like elastical scattering used for the conventional TM and elastically scattered use, use for the high resolution TM images. We will come across. So, this is a sample preparation I mentioned as the TDS task for the uh, TM machine. So, this is a sample holder. This very small piece is shown over here. And then here is your TM grid. This is again, this zoom, this is a zoom view of this portion and this is zoom view of TM grid. This is generally of copper. These are the some mesh, copper mesh. So generally what we do, suppose your sample is in a uh, powder form, we dissolve, kind of disperse in some solvent which can evaporate like BI water or acetone. Then we keep it in some ultrasonic cleaner and then we drop, put few drop over here. So that some particle of your sample can come over your TM grid. But make sure this sample are electron transparent. Electron transparent means less than 100 nanometer. This is very important criteria for the TM machine. Your sample should be electron transparent. That's why all sample cannot be analyzed in your uh, TM machine. Your sample should be electron transparent. This is very important. Now thinning of the sample. This is must suppose we have sample which is not electron transparent so we have to make it electron transparent let's assume this is a sample which is having some 3 mm thickness okay suppose if you want to take our sample from here so we have to go for pre-thinning means pre-thinning polishing or something you have to take 
and then you have to thin it down let's say 0.1 mm then for final thinning you can go for electrolytic thinning or iron milling this is generally done for the focal sanding so gallium ion is kind of directed towards this region they take out the material from here so this area gets very 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 thin that is electron transparent zone this area becomes electron transparent zone we cut it and we take it to the electron grid so there again like in diastem we did image formation so there are different kind of contrast so contrast means again number of electron play of the electron so there should be sufficient contrast in image so here in tm your contrast relies on the deflection of electron from their primary path so so there let's say suppose this is your primary path how much they are deflected from their primary path this will decide your contrast this contrast is basically generated due to difference in the number of electron scattered this is a transmitted wing how many of electrons are scattered from the transmit primary part or how many going in other direction this will decide the contrast in the tm machine again there is a two mechanism we will see one by one first one is mild density contrast so deflection of electron from the whatever uh, is there electron in your suppose you are having some sample some atom is there so deflection of electron from the electron of atomic nucleus they will what will produce they will produce collision with the uh, uh, the electron incident electron will collide with your atom inside your sample so after this uh, interaction the electron will change its path after collision okay so this is this is known as a mass density contrast this is generally used used for the non non, non crystal material which is not which is not polycrystalline in sample or single crystal so this is mostly used for the amorphous sample how we define contrast over here contrast is defined as a c is equal to i0 minus it over i0 so i what is i0 the incident beam intensity is i0 and the transmitted beam intensity this one is i t transmitted t for time transmitted and d for so this ratio is known as a contrast formation so this is for the amorphous sample so basically mass density is defined as a project of dense product of density and thickness at this point let's say suppose if you want to take image over here so this is defined as density of the material and thickness over here so this is main mechanism for the formation of the tm image in amorphous solid now let's come to the optical part so this is your optic axis this is your objective lens this is object plane and this is your image plane there is one very important plane that is back focal plane diffraction plane this is a plane from where we can get uh, uh, information about the structural information about the material it is used for the structural analysis let's come to the diffraction contrast so first one was mass density that is was for the amorphous this is for the polycrystalline material so here what what is the diffraction diffraction is basically collective if you can see this is a sample this is an incident beam that is i not and all are collectively deflected collective deflection of electron is known as a diffraction so again diffraction contrast is a main mechanism for image formation in crystalline specimen so basically here electron if you can see they scatter collaboratively by pal see if you see here these, these are parallel plane of atom which is there in the polycrystalline material not in amorphous that's why diffraction contrast we get we, we get in polycrystalline material so electron is scattered collaboratively by parallel crystal parallel plane so this is back condition we know it from the xrd also uh, whenever we get peak in xrd diffraction pattern so black condition should satisfy similarly here also if we uh, suppose this uh, black condition satisfy at certain angle angles so we get constructive diffraction pattern so here the electrons are coming and here is a sample so this is enlarged view so at some condition if suppose this black condition is satisfied what we will get we will get constructive diffraction pattern so corresponding to constructive diffraction we will get this kind of uh, um, spot and the spot is in back focal plane this is known as a back focal plane this is your back focal plane 
now this is again optic path of pm machine so in pm there can be images can be taken two modes first one is image mode second one is in direction mode i uh, most suppose if you want to take image mode so what this is for the image mode so this is your optical path for the image mode so there is a specimen you have kept your specimen then objective lens reciprocal space this is and then you have uh, your image is forming over here then you focus kind of project your image over here this is focused on the image plane over here however in the diffraction mode what is there this is your polycrystalline sample some beams beams are being deflected over here as i mentioned some dots are being formed you see some dots are being formed back focal plane so in diffraction mode whatever is formed on the back focal plane that is kind of projected on fluorescent screen however in the image whatever is formed on the image plane that is focused on the fluorescent screen that is the difference the image plane is um, is projected on the fluorescent screen in the image mode however in the diffraction mode back focal plane is projected on the fluorescent screen so this kind of dotted pattern we get so this is from you see so this is basically diffraction mode can you see this um, spotted pattern so suppose your sample is crystalline in some area so just we focus select that area and we get this kind of side selected area diffraction pattern from here we can get lot many information about the structure of the structural information like lattice parameter lattice spacing d spacing lot many even phase formation can be even some, suppose you have some defects in crystal that can be estimated from the uh, this diffraction pattern so this kind of pattern can be obtained if we focus back focal plane over fluorescent screen now in this also there is two kind of images bright field and dark field as i mentioned that what for this kind of images we use elastically scattered electron for conventional imaging we use inelastically scattered conventional tm and for dark field and hrtm high resolution tm we use elastically scattered again there are two modes bright field and dark field what is bright field suppose these are your uh, back focal point so suppose if your light going transmitted way to pass with the objective aperture this is our objective aperture if you pass this allow this transmitted beam to pass through this is your hot uh, this is your central spot if we allow to pass through this is your bright field and if we stop somehow if you if you see this is stop we just allow to direct the beam to pass through this kind of image is known as a dark field image so this kind of image that is dark field is allowed is obtained by not allowing the diffraction and uh, di this transmitted beam to the objective aperture however bright in bright field image we allow the transmitted field uh, image to pass to the objective aperture so this is the main uh, imaging mode in pm machine bright field and dark field in bright transmitted beam is allowed to pass to the objective and in the dark field image only Uh, only diffracted beam is allowed to the pass to the objective aperture. So in this way, we can get lot of information with the combination of both, by the bright field as well as dark field. So this is some example of bright field images of aluminium alloy. So here again, the contrast between A and B can be seen. So here, whatever is see here, it is bright, but the same is dark over here. So this is the difference. why this difference is there suppose the same sample is here we have just tilted the sample this is the effect of tilting of the sample in the pm machine once we have tilted the sample black condition is disturbed so whatever was being satisfied that is not satisfied that is satisfying in some other area earlier this was satisfying for this now it has changed for something else it has it is constructed completely destructive for this so this individual grains can be marked with numbers just by tilting of the specimen by few degree maybe less than 1 degree even so just by tilting of the specimen different kind of images can be obtained entire kind of structure analysis can be performed now let's come to the phase constant 
we have seen mass density contrast as well as diffraction contrast mass density was mass density is used mostly for the amorphous solid and diffraction contrast for polycrystalline sample in both the contrast generally we use electron wave phase difference in the electron wave but in hrtm that is the electrically scattered electron beam passing through the sample we use its phase so it gives additional information better resolution that is why it is known as a high resolution transmission electron microscope because in a mass density and diffraction contrast we are using amplitude contrast but in hrtm we are using phase contrast we are using phase of the electron see just now i mentioned that electron is associated with the wave so this wave is having amplitude as well as phase if we are here using amplitude only so it will give either mass density contrast or diffraction contrast but if you are analyzing its phase also so it will give us high resolution tm images means images the same machine but its resolution will be improved so phase contrast should involve at least two electron beam and what are that electron beam that one uh, one should be transmitted and one uh, diffracted beam means it should be bright field only it can't be dark field because in dark field if you remember just now i told that transmitted beam is blocked through the block it cannot pass to the aperture so for hrtm image it should be the bright one bright field image at least you have one the transmitted beam then only with respect to that you can see the change in the phase of the diffracted beam this is a very important point the phase change in the diffracted beam should be measured with respect to transmitted beam so two beam there should be must there is must to take two beam that is a bright field so it is must to involve at least two electron wave that are different in wave phase if it is being diffracted that will then uh, definitely its phase will change and it will have information about from where it is being diffracted from which crystal plane it is being diffracted okay so a crystal structure with periodic lattice like this kind of structure if it is being diffracted or this kind of structure different structure is there this will have information about whether it is uh, being diffracted with uh, this facing something like say d1 or let's say d2 so it will have this information so this will be used for the hrtm analysis it will form kind of fringes and come so can you see this fringes this this is hrtm images so these fringes are used for the hrtm analysis this uh, this is constituted from the phase contrast and again here you can see some bright image some dark image this is a jet contrast this is basically silicon germanium alloy nanowire this i have given for my phd thesis so there i have synthesized silicon germanium alloy nanowire so in fact tm analysis confirm uniform distribution of germanium in silicon here you can see some dark images because germanium is having uh, germanium is higher than silicon so whatever is brighter place that is confirming the presence of germanium another is silicon so germanium is uniformly distributed in silicon again this side pattern is confirming ring pattern if it is polycrystalline material then it will be ring pattern if it is amorphous then it will be diffuse ring this ring pattern also can give us lot of information if it is kind of amorphous diffuse ring so it is amorphous but here you can see it's spotted it means it is polycrystalline now from the place separation from where it is coming it is coming from the phase contrast in the hrtm this uh, this phase is coming from the print this uh, from the fringes we can measure the interplanar spacing here you can see 0.55 nanometer so this is basically uh, the uh, this uh, lattice spacing that is uh, lattice constant of the silicon germanium so this was all uh, here i have for dn data analysis i have provided a link very interesting link Uh, the main thing is data acquisition is okay but data analysis is as important as data acquisition data uh, three things first thing is sample preparation second one is data acquisition third is data analysis so since due to a uh, uh, limited time i am not able to discuss data analysis but you can watch this video link is given over here so it's very interesting so this was all about
analysis. These are few references which I have considered for making this uh, notes uh, presentation. So this was all, and thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you. It was very nice and informative session for all. Thank you very much once again.